And first of all, okay. And first of all, we're going to have a look at the background, the origin of this research. Why I decided to work on increasing learning autonomy, uh, then at its definition and why it is important. We're going to have a look at some teacher and student's role. If you if you remember the pre webinar quest, uh, we're going to sh to share like the results. And then some ideas to increasing learning, uh, increasing learning autonomy inside the classroom, some ideas for doing it outside the classroom. And the results of this research, the conclusions I, I got to, and we'll have some time for questions, definitely. So everything started back in 2021. We were still in the, in the lockdown. And I'm, I found myself with this class. As you can see, I had yeah, around five names, not even students, because they wouldn't show their faces on camera. They wouldn't speak at all. They were extremely passive. They would just do what they were told to do. It was just me talking and them typing. This was a, a, an upper secondary class intermediate class, which means teenagers 15 to 17 years old. So this was my main sample. Later on, I included another teenager class and a primary plus class. And well, I had this problem and I was asking myself like, okay, what is happening? Why is it that they don't want to participate? What's wrong with the materials? Because materials, they look nice. They were relevant, they were up to date. So what's wrong with them? Why were they not doing homework, for example? So there was not really meaningful learning. There was no real interaction. So I wanted to find out what was going on. And I came across the term of learner autonomy. So before we, before we continue, I want you to please type in the chat briefly, what is learner autonomy for you and why it is important? What, what is it and why is it important? Yeah. Okay, self-motivation, feeling free to express yourself, nice. Okay, self-practice, emancipating, very important, definitely. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Willingness, great Andrew. Their way of learning. Yes. Yeah, everything is quite relevant, definitely, and it has to do with the, with the definition. So, Thurnberry defines learner autonomy as the capacity to take responsibility for and control of your own learning, whether in an institutional context or independently from the institution or the teacher. From his definition, I took three keywords, which were responsibility, control, and independent. If autonomous learners are responsible, it means that they are aware of their own learning process. They know what they like, they know what their strengths are, they know what their weaknesses are, and they work upon them. And they have the right attitude towards learning. If they can take control of their own learning, it means that they can take actions. It's not just they just them, them listening, the, uh, listening to the teacher, doing what the teacher says. No, they can do stuff. They can take the initiative as well. And if they are independent, or if they, if they achieve independence, it means that they can take different roles, different active roles, not just listeners. They, they, can, they can be leaders, they can be feedbackers, they can monitor activities. They can choose what to learn, how to learn it. So, however, Thurnberry doesn't specify these learning they are responsible for and they take control of. They, that, he, he doesn't specify which aspects of this learning. However, Holek, years before, defined those aspects as determining the objectives uh, of the course of the lesson, uh, determining the contents and progression, so it's also about syllabus, selecting the methods and techniques to be used, like 
being part in the decision making process, uh, monitoring their own procedure of acquisition and even evaluating what they have acquired. This could be through respective practice, ongoing assessment, formative assessment. So these are the five concrete aspects of learning they can be responsible for and take control of. Now, the, the second question was, why learner autonomy? Why is this important? And especially in, in my experience in non-English speaking environments like Venezuela, like it's not that they can go out on the street and speak English with the first person they encounter. No, that won't happen. So why is it important? Well, first, autonomous learners are motivated. This increases motivation. Why? Because they can see results. They know why they're learning English. They like what they're doing. They know what they need to work on. And this keeps them going. It also increases commitment. Why? Because they're involved. Uh, they choose, they take decisions. The activities they do in class are not the activities the teacher decided to apply. No, they were involved in that. They had a voice, they had, they had a vote. So be, because of that decision power they had, uh, they are committed to do what, they are, what, they, what they're supposed to do. It also increases happiness because they see results. They see their progress, their sense of progress, their this respective practice of self-awareness. And also increases focus because since they know their strengths and they know their, their weaknesses, which are their action points, they know exactly in which areas they need to improve and which specific activities they can do to improve their performance in those areas. It also encourages them to benefit from learning opportunities. They, it, it's not about the conformity of coming to class twice a week or once a week. It's about outside practice. It's about their own routines of using English outside the classroom, being this, playing video games, listening to music, reading, doing another course where the language of instruction is English, chatting with friends abroad. All of those are learning opportunities. And finally, it encourages learners to take risks. Taking risks means, for example, they would take a course that really interests them in English. Or if we're talking about other learners or uh, teenagers about to finish high school, applying for a university in an English speaking country and taking the internet, that's taking a risk and using English for that. Maybe they'll be successful, maybe they won't, but they're taking the risk and that's the important thing. The question would be now how to develop learner autonomy and Schultz and Savo propose these three stages. It's about raising awareness because students don't necessarily know that it is their class and they can take decisions and be in charge of that. Then it's about changing their attitudes and finally transferring the roles. So in raising awareness, it's first about boosting intrinsic motivation. At least uh, in my experience in, in Latin America, mainstream schools are used to being teaching center, teacher centered. The teacher talks, the students listen, the interaction is mostly student teacher, teacher student, and there's no other option. option. So for example, when they come to the British Council, they're exposed to student led lessons, different types of interaction, different types of activities, they're, they're now able to choose or at least to give their opinion on what they're doing. So that is important because not, not all the students, especially teenagers, will be learning English because they want to or because they like, they like it, no. Uh, most of them will be because their parents want, want them to be in the course or because they need to improve their grades at school or because they're going to take an international exam to apply for a university. So if we don't get them genuinely interested in, le in learning the language, if we don't get them to do what they like using the language, it would be really difficult to develop autonomous learners. So it's about getting to know themselves, the way they learn, what they like about the language, how English can become something they like because they can do whatever they want with it. And also being aware of their own learning 
styles, learning preferences. Then presenting those different viewpoints. Like, okay, it's not you listening to me. You are going to contribute. Getting them exposed to all those new experiences. And as I said before, it's a matter of self-discovery. Once this is done, we go to changing their attitudes. Now it's getting them used to this new universe. So there's a lot of learner training and it's a lot of monitoring and trial and error. The same strategies or activities you use for a class or for a particular group of students won't necessarily work well with another group or with another class because every single case is different. That's why you need to check how students react and get rid of what doesn't work and keep what is effective and adapt all the time. Finally, it's about transferring roles. Students now are used to this new universe, as I said before. So there's shared responsibility. Now, we as a teacher are not 100% in charge of what happens in the classroom. They have the responsibility to do it too. In terms of, for example, classroom management, the teacher doesn't have to be the only one who monitors what students do or who gives instruction or who clarifies understanding or who provides input or feedback, students can also do it. Even setting up the classroom. In the end, is their class, is their classroom. So they can take part in it. Again, we give them decision power. So we have the syllabus and any institution we have to use it, but we also have their needs and interests. So we can take them into account and they can give their opinion. If, if as a whole, they think that something is useless, okay, how can we adapt it? How can we make it useful? If not, what can we do instead that is useful to you? And that's how they achieve independence in the, in the end, right? So I know the theory sounds beautiful, sounds amazing, sounds perfect, sounds flawless, but how can we promote it inside the classroom? How can you promote learner autonomy inside the classroom? Please type some ideas in the chat. Okay. Yeah, positive reinforcement. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Getting them to talk about what they do in English. Nice. Motivation. Feedback always useful. Okay. So remember, uh, well, remember Thumbry, he gives us a really useful tip. He says, giving learners some say in the choice and management of classroom activities is a step in the direction of autonomy. My question when I started working on this was, how much say do I give my learners? And that was my my implicit question for you in the pre-webinar quest. So let's have a look at some of the results. Okay. And see, some people still doing it. That's why I decided to, to work straight with the, with the Google Forms. So for example, choosing the aims, as you, as you can see, most of, of the participants uh, take this responsibility as teachers. They choose the aims. Some of us let students uh, get involved in them. Same with the language, skill focus. According to this, it relies mostly on the teacher. The topics and activities is a bit more balanced. Still, the teachers are mostly in charge. Who writes on the board, checks. There's a bit of balance here. So there's shared responsibility between teacher and students. Same with uh, who they speak to. So according to this, most of the interaction is either among students or with a teacher included. Who pairs up the students or who groups the students? This is, this is interesting. Still, most of the times teachers, but there's a significant amount of teachers who let students uh, choose as well. In online lessons, we share the screen gradually, but mostly the teachers. Who gives the meaning of word? This is really good. 
So there's a certain degree of autonomy in this probably hundreds of students because we've got like yeah, more than 30 teachers there. Who spells out words, res share responsibility, who gives explanation, again, shared responsibility, right? Who asks questions, share responsibility, that's good. Who answer the questions, great. Letting students answer the questions, they're the other ones who know as well. Who repeats what was said, great. So we let students clarify. Silences, <clears throat> most of the time, share responsibilities. But who breaks it? Again, show responsibility. Great. A good example of this is, okay, we, we, we have a group interaction, time's up, open class discussion. We just keep silent and we let students take the initiative. Who checks to work? Great again. Nice. And who chooses the homework? Most of the time teachers that. So well, let's go back to the slides. Good, good. Now we have a, a clear picture of our audience. Now, just a sec. Uh -huh. So, learner autonomy inside the classroom. Remember Holex aspects of learning. Well, those were the ones I took I took into account gradually, from setting up tasks to choosing activities, choosing the learning aims, up to planning. And I did it in that specific order because as you progress through them, the degree of autonomy required is more. So, in choosing the in, in setting up the tasks, as I said before. As a teacher, I don't have to give the instructions all the time or clarify the language. I can let one of my students do it. Like, can you please tell us what we have to do? Or maybe elicit the instructions from them. Like, what is this? What do you have to do here? Uh, can you do this? Yes or no? Are you going to write this or that? Same with clarification. You can ask another student, can you please clarify? Or she doesn't understand. Can we help her? Same with interaction pattern. It really depends on how they feel that day. So would you like to do this activity in pairs or individually? Would you like to work in groups? So it's really up to them. <clears throat> and then we would go, we would go to choosing the activities. I give them, I give, I give my, my students freedom. I usually present them with a menu. Like, would you like to do this or that? We'd like to do an individual reading activity or a reading race, or we'd like to practice vocabulary or do a scavenger hunt, something like that. And this could be before the class. Like for example, what would you like to do tomorrow? Practice listening or practice reading, practice speaking or practice writing. Uh, or during the class, again, I present up with the mania. What would you like to do now? Uh, a grammar game or speaking game? Or after the lesson, we've got 15 minutes left. So what would you like to do now? Play a pronunciation domino or play taboo? And when it comes to choosing the aims, uh, one of the things we can do is show them, show them the, the syllabus if you're, if you're using a textbook or show them the, the pacing if the institution has a specific program or just show, uh, just brainstorm some ideas. Let's have a look at this. What do you find useful? What do you find irrelevant? What do you, what do you think is challenging? And based on that, uh, you decide what the aims of the class or the aims of the lesson would be uh, aligned with their specific needs and interests. Same goes with planning. To plan a class, why don't you apply a really detailed needs analysis? For example, what I do is on the first class, I give my students an online questionnaire a really detailed online questionnaire, and I do a focus group at the same time. So I, go, I, I, I get their data from the questionnaire and the feedback and input from the, from the focus group. In that, apart from their needs and interests, I ask them questions like, what do you think is the best way to evaluate you? And in terms of project, like this is a project from the, from the magazine or from the textbook, but we also have these options. Which one do you prefer? It's a matter of adapting, it's a matter of cons reaching consensus. So <clears throat> let's have a look at how this looks in, into practice. So I wrote this for you. This is a, 
a page from the British Council Secondary Plus Intermediate at Twist in Detail magazine. I used this because these are the materials we use at the British Council. However, you can use any published material, the English file, headway, cutting edge, whichever. It works. These ideas work with any published material or authentic material. So these are the aims of the lesson. You have to follow the storylines of two different versions of a fairy tale, which is literary writing hood. You need to identify and practice narrative tenses. You need to compare the two versions of the same story and retell a story from a different character's point of view. And we've got a, a top-down watching activity where students have to if the statements refer to the traditional version to the modern version, and the watch, uh, then they watch and check. Then the bottom-up watching activity, uh, which is true or false, and finally, a discussion. How would you implement some of the ideas for increasing learner autonomy inside the classroom in this lesson? Let's type some ideas in the chat. Yeah, how would you implement some of those ideas? <laughs> think about think about the activities, think about the interaction pattern, think about how would you set up the tasks. Let's start with it with those first aspects, choosing like setting up the tasks and choosing the activities. How would you do it? Or how would you your students do it? Mm -hmm. Oh, role play. Good idea. Definitely. Okay. Different tasks per group. Nice. Yeah, of course. Yeah, they can choose what to do. Mm -hmm. Acting out the story, different voices. A group discussion. Asking questions. Yeah, maybe to set up the task, you can just ask questions. Like, Role play, role play, nice. Work on vocabulary, a language game. Oh. Oh. Definitely, role play is a prevalent idea. I like it. Mind storytelling and creative writing. Great, great, great. So I'm going to walk you through a demo lesson. This was a real lesson. And in fact, I requested a senior teacher to observe this class as my second formal observation of the year, because I wanted to measure my progress in developing these learners. So these were the aims. But by this time, these learners had been with me for, enti for an entire year. So I changed them a bit based on their needs and interests. So now they have to review the original version of the tale, which is another one from the magazine, watch the, the other two different versions, analyze them. They had already worked on narrative tenses, so I focus this time on time phrases for narrating fairy tales. They will create their own version, so that would involve a bit of creative writing as well, and they will role play or story tale the story, and in the end, we will choose the best version. To start the lesson, in the previous class, I gave them a flip classroom activity. I just told them, I'm going to give you this audio file, and I want you to listen to someone reading a fairy tale. It was me reciting the original version, and they were really interested in this topic of fairy tale. 
uh, luckily enough. <laughs> so when they came to class, we had a short discussion, like which differences uh, between the original and children's version do you notice? And was there anything surprising? For example, in the original version, there are two wolves and both are killed by this red riding hood and the granny. And then a pop cahoot quiz to, to measure how much they could remember from the original tale. And I moved into the first activity, but I never told them to open their magazines. Instead, I showed them a menu. What do you want to do? Make guesses about the story or play an auction game? If they chose number one, I would uh, uh, direct them to magazine page four. Okay, let's do it. But if they chose the auction game, uh, I would just show them the statements one by one on the flip chart. And they would have to decide if they were about the uh, the modern version or the traditional version, and it needed to beat a, spe uh, a specific amount of money. Then we would check with the video, and if they were right, I would double the amount of money. If they were wrong, I would take the money from them. That money. <laughs> and well, they did that. Then they checked with the video. And for the next activity, I just showed them this. As you can see, there's no instruction. And I just asked some questions. What is this? Oh, it's some information about the story. Yep. Is it all true? They had a look. And no, there's some false information there. So what do you have to do? We need to guess if the information is true or false. Yep. Do you want to do this individually or with a partner? They chose to do it in, with a partner. It was an online lesson. I sent them to breakout rooms. I monitor them. I provided some guidance, verification, micro teaching as necessary. And when they came back, I asked them, do you want to check your answers with the video or do you want me to show the answer key straight? It was a seven minute long video. They chose to have the answer key. And they, they, they're having decision making power even on how they want to assess their progress. So that's what we did. Then I got rid of the magazine and I asked them, how about improving this tale? And yeah, why not? <laughs> and I designed these four different tasks. So I put the students in four groups and I let them choose which tasks they wanted to do. Even if all of them chose task number two, for example, it was fine because the outcome would be different. So that's what they did. They chose what to do. And before getting started, I showed them some useful language. And I asked them, what's this? Well, some phrases. Yeah, what do you have to do with them? We need to use them. Why? Well, it makes the story sound more interesting. It gives cohesion. It gives more structure. That was the, those were the kind of answers I got. So I sent them to breakout rooms. They prepared their own version. I was monitoring, providing guidance, micro teaching, language verification, taking notes on the language. And when they came back, they they acted they acted out the the stories. And we chose the, the best version and then feedback on language. And that was a, a 60 minute lesson uh, where students could decide what they wanted to do. So I hope some of these ideas are useful to you and that you try them out in your own lessons. Now let's move on, let's move on to how we do this outside the classroom. Let's write some ideas in the chat. How can you promote learning autonomy outside the classroom? How can you get your students to practice English outside on their own? Yes, projects. Uh, yeah. Tasks from home study, group tasks. Yeah, <clears throat> some useful ways, definitely. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you six ideas to do this. The first, from students as researchers to setting personal learning goals, journals, real projects, creative writing, why not? And an English diet. So let's start with the first one. 
And is there one I recommend if if you haven't tried uh, increasing learning autonomy outside the classroom? It works like this. For example, the British Council, our wild courses are uh, last about eight weeks. So what I do is in week one, I get students to choose one single aspect of English that's very difficult for them and that they would like to improve. Then they write their action points being this activities they can do outside the classroom on their own to improve on this weakness they have in a period of eight weeks. And I make sure they write smart action points. Things that are really specific, measurable, time bound, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they experiment with this from week two to week seven. I check every, like once a week on the progress and they keep what is a record of what is useful for them and they get rid of what is not useful for them. And in week eight, they present their outcomes. Like, okay, this term, I wanted to work on my spoken fluency. So these were the activities that I tried and that worked for me. So in the end, students build up a huge resource bank that everyone else can try out. It doesn't necessarily have to be a presentation. It could be a padlet, a poster. It's really up to you and up to them. And this can be escalated to my second idea, which is personal learning goals. And this is an example from a student on week four. And basically now it's not just one aspect of English. It's three or four that they would like to improve and they need to set smart learning goals that they can achieve in an eight week period. Okay. As you can see, these are really, really specific. They look like the ones we do in a, we, we write in our lesson plans. But that's the idea. We need to train them to write aims and then train them to keep track of aims. Again, if the students are new to this practice, you check once a week. If, not, if they are used to that, you check week one, week four, and finally week eight. And they present their outcomes in the end. And the idea of this is that they build up a routine and that they raise their own awareness of their strengths and weaknesses and learn how to work on that. My next idea is journals and I focus mostly on Lexis journal. It works like this. New word you learn, new word you add to the table, you write the meaning in English, synonym, collocation, antonym, depending on the level the translation into the L1 and example in a sentence and part of speech. This is from an elementary student. So if an elementary student can do it, it means that it works for all levels. For higher levels, what I do is I give them freedom to focus the Lexis journals on what is relevant for them. I've had Lexis journals focusing on only multi-word items or only on phrasal verbs or only on idioms. And that's something that they really enjoy. Another thing is real projects. This is an example from the British Council of a Secondary Plus Intermediate Pay It Forward magazine. The project consists of students doing, a, doing three failures for three different people and then observing whether these three people do failures for other people. <laughs> so why not making it real? So activity seven was a preparation class in which I made sure that the failures were say, doable, they were safe to do, and that students would be all the time accompanied by an adult because they were teenagers. So I gave them a week to do it. And of course they would do the failures in their L1 because we live in a, in a non-English speaking environment. But the report, they would have to write it in English. And when they came back to class, they showed their outcomes in English. So they took class content into real life. So it was more relevant, more meaningful. And they really, really, they really value it. So you can do the same with other types of projects. Just need to adapt it so they can apply it in the real life. Another thing you can do is inspire creative writing. I tried three things. The first one was blog entries. 
I use Blogger because it allows students to create a private blog and share the link only with you for cyber protection reasons. And uh, well, yeah, they write one entry a week about anything they like. Example, playing guitar, food, video games. And you check their entries once a week and you give feedback and content. The idea is not, necess not necessarily to correct their language, but rather to encourage further practice. That's why feedback and content. Same with, uh, with diaries. If your students like to write diaries or like to write about their days, uh, Penzu is a great app. And again, diaries are, re are really private things. So if they want to share their entries with you, great. If not, that's fine as long as they keep writing. The idea is that they practice English. If you're into poetry, as Kat said, I, I'm, a, I'm an English literature teacher as well. Well, acrostic poems are a good start, and there are many po uh, acrostic poem generators uh, on the internet. So again, if they want to share the poems with you, amazing. If not, that's fine. They're practicing English outside the classroom. That's, a, that's what we want. And my last idea is a, an English diet. We're not changing the eating habits here. We're just proposing a routine. Example, read, a, read an online post every day, read a short story every week, or write about your day, or write to-do lists in English, or shopping lists in English. Talk to someone in English weekly, watch, watch a series or cartoon episode a day, listen to a song in English every day. And they can do what is interesting for them, or they can eliminate things, add things that are useful and fun for them, things that they like. The idea is that they get used to a routine, to use English outside the classroom, doing what they like instead of just doing homework, workbook pages 9 to 11, exercise 13, something like that. Okay. So I hope these ideas are useful to you and that you try them out. And well, the results. As I said before, uh, at the beginning, I had passive and shy students. Uh, they had no initiative. There was no group dynamics at all. Homework was horrible for them. They, they really complained a lot. And learning was vanishing. There was no meaningful learning at all. After a year of working on developing their autonomy, I had active participants share responsibility because they were involved in classroom management, setting up tasks, uh, choosing activities, choosing learning aims, even planning. So I had proactive students. My lessons were student-led. They had goals instead of homework. So homework didn't exist. It was their goals that were, that were useful for their own lives and objectives. And learning was meaningful now. And the ultimate goal, my students were independent. So as a conclusion, well, my students weren't participating because they were not engaged and motivated. The magazines were great, but the activities were not interesting or relevant for them, and they couldn't choose what to do. Uh, the detailed needs analysis and initial conversations were crucial to find out what actually motivates them. And Charles and Savo's stages, raising awareness, changing attitudes, and transparent roles really helped them become more active and independent. Finally, uh, the activities to practice English outside were a key factor for them to become autonomous and they were effective because they were relevant and they had the entire power of choosing what they wanted to do outside the classroom. And finally, students are part of your team. So just listen to them and take them into account. In case you want to find out more, these were the references I used. And well, thank you. And I guess it's now time for questions. Thank you, Jorge, for that session. That was really interesting. Loads of really great ideas. And it's really interesting to hear your experience. Um, I think it's um, relevant that on World Teachers Day, we talk about shared responsibility, um, which I'm a big fan of as well, is like getting in students involved and it not being so teacher led. And I think that's, you know, that's a great goal. And that really helps students feel more engaged with the class and more part of the team. So I think, you know, as you said, you put it a team rather than you being the teacher. I think that's really interesting. Um, OK, we've got a lot of questions um, in the Q&A. So we're going to have a look at some of those because we've got time. Um, okay, can, I, can I stop sharing so it's easier? Um, yeah, if you'd like to. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, of course. 
Okay, so um, we've got lots of questions. Um, the first question is quite simple. It's about the Red Riding Hood lesson. Uh, which age group did you focus that lesson on, the Red Riding Hood? Uh, the lesson was uh, teenagers, upper secondary plus, from 15 to 17 years old. Okay. Um, do you think, and another question that we've had um, uh, from, there was a question here uh, from Menaka. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. She said, which age, uh, sorry, uh, no, that is the same question. Somebody was asking, when can you start um, with sort of learn autonomy? This is Fiona, sorry, Fiona uh, Rodrigo. At what age does autonomy start? That's a good question. Like how, is this something you would do with very young learners or what What do you think? Well, it, the, the age range would be one of the single factors that determines the, the range of autonomy you can give. For mm -hmm. example, I've, I've tried this with early years. Mm -hmm. Like from two to five and what the, the things that i've seen have to work are like choosing activities and setting up tasks right so like yeah. for example uh, do you want to read a story or watch the video version or do you want me read the story for you or do you want to read it yourself hmm. or which story do you want to read today this one or this one yeah so, small degree of autonomy but it works yeah, and sure. We, one might think that as learners get older, you can give them more autonomy. But doing this research with when I included my face to face primary plus class, which is 10 to 12 year olds, uh, to my surprise, in just six months, they had become as autonomous as my 15 to 17 year old teenagers in one year. Right. Really, like, as I said before, each case is totally different. Yeah, I think sometimes as well, maybe we underestimate uh, yeah. what our students can do a little bit. And actually, if you give them control, um, they can they can surprise us. Not always, but a lot of the time. Um, we've got a good question from Chris Fry talking about motivation. He was saying, you know, having a reason to learn English is very motivating. Um, but what happens if you don't have a good reason to learn English? Can the teacher help students find a reason to learn English? Um, and he suggested that maybe, you know, if, if, if you only have one student who has a good reason, uh, they can talk about it and what they do in English. But if you have students like, you know, if you're in a, for example, you're in a Spanish speaking environment, maybe they don't have any contacts with real English, real life uh, people. I mean, obviously, everyone's got contact with English outside the class. How can you encourage them to find a reason um, to learn English? Well, you can appeal to their likes. What do you mm -hmm. like? What do you usually like to do? And how can we include English into that? Like intrinsic, intrinsic motivation is not just about the, the fact that you like learning English. It's about the fact that you do what you do, what you like in English. Yeah. So if you like listening to music or playing video games, okay, why don't we include a bit of that? Yeah. I think yeah. these days it's easier, isn't it? Because most of our students will enjoy doing one of those things, like watching films or listening to music or playing video yeah. games. Um, so I think most students, especially young learners, can find a reason um yeah. to, to improve their English as a kind of motivating um force. Um what else? Uh we've also got some questions um about uh less confident learners. This is again Fiona has got another question. Do you have any techniques to improve autonomy with regard to less confident learners? Do you think there's a relationship between being confident in the language and autonomy? Uh, it, there, there might be a, uh, like a, rela a relation inside the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, but since, like, we will have to see like in which specific aspect the student is shy, let's call it like that. But let's suppose he's speaking in class, for example. You can give that student prompts like, or mm -hmm. pair, pair the student up with people they feel comfortable working with and then mm -hmm. gradually vary the interaction patterns. Like finding yeah. this, this this body that would be with uh, like supporting this student and then you know including everyone else mm. like an option. Yeah, I mean you talked about giving students autonomy with interaction as well, so them deciding who they want to work with, which can sometimes be beneficial for for shyer students or weaker yeah. students, for example. Yeah. Um, another comment from Chris Fry who was talking about a group he had where at the beginning of every class, he allowed students to talk about what they had done out of class that week with English. So it could be they borrowed books um, to read at home or they'd been to see a film or a play or a concert. Um, and he said, sometimes we spent half an hour on this before you know, starting the lesson. Um, 
but with lower level students, what, what could you do, do you think, with lower level students? Um, what kind of activities could they do outside the classroom and have this kind of moment at the beginning of the class where you talk about what you've done outside the class? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, yes, definitely. First, uh, they, they need to be clear on what they need to improve. Of course, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have the, meta, the, the, the metacognitive skills to find out what to do outside, so you can give them options. Mm -hmm. okay, you, need, you need to improve your speaking accuracy. Give them some, resource, some resources to try out. That's why there's an, that, that's an experimentation period. And you mm -hmm. check every week whether what you gave them worked or not. And you mm -hmm. can try new things. The idea of, like, the key to this to be effective is to show students that you care about what you're doing. That's yeah. why you need to check every single week. And try not to put pressure on them. Oh, oh George, I haven't had time to work on this. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I understand that you can be busy with all the things, but I really, I'm really excited to, to see your, your progress next week instead okay. of your Just a question about that. Do you ever get any um, pushback from parents about that being their homework? It hasn't happened to me, interesting. <laughs> okay, no, just wondering. Okay, that's good. That's interesting. Um, we've got a question here from Judith as well, who's saying, when you give students a choice, and it's a whole class activity in a real classroom. For example, you know, do you want to do a listening or a speaking? Um, do you go with what the majority want always? And, and what can you do, if so, to please the minority, the people who haven't voted for the activity that you're doing? Well, if it's a whole class, they will, they will have a menu at different stages of the lesson. Mm -hmm. And basically in those options, they will reach exactly the same goal. What varies is the path. Mm -hmm. So just, and as you get to know your learners, your choice, your, your options will be all appealing, to, all appealing for them. So, okay. so I think it's basically about that. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question here about um, artificial intelligence, which is obviously, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, hot topic uh, these days. Um, so this is from Alphonse Gatum. He's saying, what is your take on AI and its impact on learner autonomy? Could it possibly have more adverse impact on the building of this autonomy as learners now can find easier ways of outsourcing their tasks to machines? Um, do you have any ideas for how to use, this is a big question, any ideas oh, yeah, for how to use <laughs> AI? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, I, I would have to, to explore that a bit more. Mm. What I've done, for example, uh, I once uh, had a class, it was a TBL lesson, in which at the beginning they just had to teach an old lady, an 18 year old lady, how mm. to send a text message to her daughter using a very old phone. Mm. Then the final task after some language input was how to help a person with special educational needs or disabilities do a task using their favorite phone app. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the role cards was a person with visual impairment. So my suggestions to, to my suggestion to students were, since they had to teach that person without touching the phone, teach them how to give prompts to their Siri, Google Assistant. Mm -hmm. And so they are practicing English with AI yeah, and in yeah. a very productive way. That's, that's what comes to my mind at this point. Yeah. I guess with AI, I mean, one of the things is when you're asking them to do tasks outside the classroom, one of the things we've spoken about in other webinars is how do you know that it's the students doing the task and they haven't just asked chat GPT? Um, oh, yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think this is a problem. This is kind of a whole series of webinars, I think, rather than a, a question. But it's a, it's a good question to think about, um, especially in terms of um, autonomy. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. What else about the questions? Um, I've got a question from, I think it's PK, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, who's saying, how can I improve independent and creative thinking when learners are to predict a story ending like Little Red Riding Hood? I guess she's, uh, they're, they're talking about how, how you can um, promote creative thinking um, and being autonomous in that way, trying to be original uh, with creative writing that you spoke about. A good example is, okay, we'll create an alternative ending. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, in one of the the final tasks that I that I put was okay, create a story with a sad ending. But how about right. just mm -hmm. 
choose a different way to end the story or tell the story from another character's point of view mm -hmm. or change the setting of the story. Yeah. So actually giving them a prompt to help them. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Let's, yeah, transform, that's a nice idea. let's transform Little Red Riding Hood into a dystopia. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One question I had actually was um, when you talk about, and I think this is something that as teachers we kind of, or I know I do, I hone in on a little bit. When you're talking about giving um, choices in the classroom, so you're saying, you know, we could do this activity or this activity, um, does that always mean um, a bigger workload for the teacher in terms of preparation? Or how do you avoid that, that you're preparing, you know, multiple different classes? Not really, because what you what you're changing is the type of activities that you use. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we like every teacher has their own repertoire of games, activities, role plays. It's just a matter of putting them into the lesson in a way that they're relevant for students. Like there's not really much variation, and what it is just every every now and then I, I want to try a new idea, then I include mm -hmm. it. But most of the times I have my own repertoire. Okay, so you don't you don't find yourself preparing eight different oh, no, versions no. of the same lesson. Okay, In that, fact, it, it takes it takes me way longer to use a textbook approach than to plan yeah. a lesson like that. Yeah, and um, did you find as well when you started doing this with your students? I guess it it takes a little bit of learner training. For example, I really like the idea where you said you take away the instructions, you just show them the activity, and say, right, what's this? Um, I imagine if students aren't used to that kind of approach, you probably uh, there's probably silence the first time you do that. How long does it take you to kind of get classes um, understanding what they have to do and, and really participating in the way you described? Well, it really depends on how effective and simple your ICQs are. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so can you give us an example? <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. uh, in, the, in my example of true or false again. Right. Uh, is this information about any topic or about the story? Is all this information true or there's some false information? Okay. So what do you have to do? you need to answer these questions with the reading or without the reading? Okay. Yeah, that's great. And then students are automatically, they're having to think, right? So it's what you're talking about with the active participation. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, well, listen, Jorge, thank you very much. That was a great session. I think we've answered yeah. all of the questions. Um, we had a lot of questions in the chat. So thanks very much for that session. It was really great. Thank you also to everybody who has been helping behind the scenes, all the moderators and all the participants for all your great questions and uh, participation. And I hope you found that session as interesting as I did. And uh, um, we hope to see you at the session that will be starting soon. We can now come out of this session and join the other session, which is starting in about 15 minutes. So happy uh, World Teachers Day to everyone once again, and I uh, hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much.